Thank you. Uh, I know quite a few people in the room, but those that don't know me, yes, I'm Simon Watson. I'm Principal Scientist, Forest Fire Ecology at uh, Department of Energy, Environment and Climate Action. Um, the role that I'm in is essentially the similar role to, to what Gordon Friend was in uh, about a decade ago for anyone who knew Gordon. Um, I'll, begin, I'll begin just uh, acknowledging traditional owners of the land we're on, we're under people. It's great to be here. Um, a privilege and recognise the elders past and present. I'd also like to recognise the work I live and work on Jarra country in central Victoria. Um, the work that this relates to relates to traditional owner lands across the state of Victoria. So today I'm going to run through three different parts. I'm going to start with the changing shape of bushfires in Victoria and I think there's been a fair bit on this so I shouldn't have to spend too much time on it. Um, people can try and stay awake. Uh, so uh, we've got fire ecology science after that so the the technical capabilities and programs that we've got going on and and what this sort of looks like for the current state of Victorian ecosystems and then thinking about future advancements in fire ecology science for bushfire management. So beginning with the changing shape of bushfires in Victoria I think this figure on the left might have been shown earlier um, this is looking at the the number of days uh, uh, high fire danger days above the 90th percentile from the CSIRO report in 2022. Um, and you just see this significant increase in the number of high fire, high fire danger events. Um, we look at Jason Sharple's work from quite a few years back, but looking at Pyro CB events, the types of fire events we're getting, more Pyro CB events. Um, so we're getting this change in, in fire weather, we're getting change in fire, beha fire behaviour. Something that's really interesting to do we, in Victoria, um, one of the things we like to criticise is our fire history data set. It's the envy of every other state in, in Australia. Um, we've got a pretty good fire history data set. Um, in saying that, the 1903 to 1960 patch is still pretty sparse. Um, and when we look at the 1939 fires, which were undoubtedly large fires, um, the mapping's pretty coarse. So we see these big areas that we, we think um, burn. But it's interesting to think about that. So we then move in past 1903 to 1969, um, and we start to look at how things change, 1960s to 1980s. This encompasses the advent of uh, satellite imagery, and we start to get much better mapping. We have better record keeping. But I think what's interesting here is still some significant fires in the landscape, big areas, but we're looking at the spatial patterns of fires through Victoria, which is interesting, um, quite different to what We'll see as we move ahead. When we look at 1980 to 2000, or the 1980s through to 2000s, lots of fires, the areas burned is still, the extent of the of, of fire um, is still a lot smaller than what we see in the following 20 years. And I just want to run through. So when we get to the, the age of megafires, this is the last 20 years, um, we see a big desert, we had alpine fires, Great Divide complex, Gary Word, and ongoing. So when we take the last 100 years of known data, there's not much public land in Victoria that hasn't experienced fire. Um, it's been very prevalent across the landscape, but the shape of that fire, the extent of that fire in the landscape is changing really significantly, particularly over the last 20 years. So when we start looking at that, we start looking at things like the extent, this is what I was talking about, and I mentioned there's a bunch of fires that are actually missing. We know fires that are missing in the earlier years. And we, we also know that 1939 is a massive overestimate um, of, of area because there's no patches missing in that. It's just one big block. We know that that wasn't the case. Um, but we don't have the, the satellite imagery in the, for the 1939 was pretty poor. Um, so if we're looking at this, though, first uh, 40 years the, that we're looking at, the first 20 years, what have I got over here? 20 years. Um, one major fire that's above the long-term average. So when we take the long-term average of extent of area in, in Victoria that's burned, and then we take the next 20 years, we get a couple of fires that are above the average, a couple of fires that are above the average. 1980 to 2000, we get three fires that are above the long-term average. In the last 20 years, we've had eight that get above the long-term average. It's this huge step change in extent of area that's being affected by fire. Um, next, I want to talk, talk about frequency, and I had a, a figure, but then um, I stole David's because it was better. Um, 
So this is some work that, that was recent, that's just recently been published. Um, but what we're looking at essentially is the, the number of the total number of fires and then the number of points in the landscape that were affected by um, multiple fires. And looking at those two periods again of 1980 to 2000 and, and 2000 to, to 2020. And so what we're seeing is that shift of areas being affected by one or two fires or no fires into these multiple fires in the 20 year period. And I stole Jason Sharple's um, image here as well. The interval between those major fires is decreasing. That was in 2016. There's some nice shorter ones now. And Luke Collins's piece here looking at um, changing severity of fire as well. So these are looking at these different elements of the, the fire regime. So the annual area burnt, we see this um, increasing, um, but the proportion of high severity fire. So and this is, this is largely a relationship as well with that annual area burn. So even if fires aren't burning more severely, we're having that greater extent, so we're getting larger areas of the landscape um, being burnt by fire. So massive changes to the fire regimes that we're experiencing um, and across different elements of the regime, that extent. I did mention, actually I was gonna run back. Uh, uh, no, I won't. But the, the size of those individual fires, um, no, I will, I'll do it, because I'd like to point something out. Um, when we think about tragic fires that have occurred, the Upper Beaconsfield fires, this little this fire here, massive impacts, huge losses of life, absolutely devastating, not a big fire. Okay, um, fire ecology, science, technical capabilities. I'm going to look at three different things, um, and really looking at their, how we measure the effects of fire regimes, characteristics on plants and animals. Um, so I want to talk about the fire analysis module for ecological values. This is something we built a few years back. I want to talk about the measures that we use for looking at ecosystems relationships with fire and, and then talk about the ecosystem resilient monitoring work that we're doing. So the fire analysis module for ecological values, the strategic bushfire management plans that uh, somebody put up earlier, um, when they were being developed, there was a, a real recognition of saying, well, we've got this goal of ecosystem resilience in our, in our um, it's an objective in the code of practice for bushfire management on public land, how are we actually able to measure it and how can planners measure this at, at the sites? And we realised that we needed tools that allowed people to do this. It didn't have to be somebody who could script with R, who could had all the data sets, but we need somebody to be able to get some information so you can fill a consequence table of what you think your strategy is going to deliver. So we built this, basically it's, it's a front end, it's an R wrapper front end. We input our landscape data, our vegetation fire history data. We're inputting our species and our ecosystem data and it gives you a wrapper. We've got a front end wrapper, um, which is a, just a, a shiny app um, that can then deliver the metrics and spatial outputs that you're wanting to use for your planning. Um, this was developed by Arthur Roller Institute, Neville Amos and, and Josephine McCunter as part of a larger project that was also with the University of Melbourne looking at structured decision making in bushfire management strategies um, and inputting those ecological metrics. I'm going to talk about three different measures that we look at for uh, ecosystem resilience. We'll talk about tolerable fire intervals, growth stage structure. Um, coming out of, of David Shield's report, this is where they are proposed. As we go on, I'll also talk about the work we're doing to, to update some of these. Um, the other piece here is the fire interval, uh, it's the species habitat availability work. So looking at fire interval here, but you're looking at how much habitat is available for a species. And I'll run through what each of these metrics is and how we measure them. I like to start with tolerable fire intervals. I, I've never come across an environmental metric that seems to make people so angry. Um, like, you know, like this is like a really divisive one in fire management. And, and I actually like it because people get really upset about something that's probably not that upsetting um, when, they, when they actually get down to it. Um, there's a couple of things in this though. It, and it, it's about how you're using this tool. This is, a, this is a metric we can use as a tool. Now, tolerable fire intervals are the minimum and maximum recommended time intervals. So this is that time to maturity of obligate cedars primarily within, a, within an ecosystem. So if you have repeated fires under the minimum TFI, you're at risk of, of the state change. If you're having no fires beyond the maximum, 
tell a little fire interval where we all the get seeders have, have died out. Bearing in mind we have very little understanding of long-term seed bank storage, you know, a lot of these species, um, we, we, see, we expect to see uh, functional changes in these ecosystems. Um, the statement at the bottom there, this is, this is what Gordon Friend put in the, the original 2015 uh, policy position for tolerable fire intervals. TFIs provide a broad indicator of landscape risk as a surrogate for ecosystem resilience in the context of bushfire management. Um, when you use it like that, it's actually a really useful measure and it gives you some pretty interesting information. And if we look at the data here, just this is percentage of immature vegetation, vegetation below tolerable fire intervals, and we look at the pattern over time um, from 1980 to 2020, this is just the, the general um, measurement time that we use because from 1980s when we're fairly confident of our fire history, um, we see this massive increase in the area of immature vegetation. So this is the area of vegetation that we say, if another fire goes through in this area, the, the risk of significant change is, is higher. And it doesn't mean that there will always will be because there is all of the other elements of the fire regime. The severity of that fire that goes through, the patchiness of the fire, the fire weather conditions. So there's a whole bunch of different things. Um, but if fire affects it, it can change things. In noting that, things like the wombat, it depends on what your starting point is as well. Um, we can also look at area below minimum TFI. So this is the area that's burned below minimum TFI. And we see a very similar pattern to those bushfire years. Essentially, when you have those large bushfire years, we're seeing those large areas of, of burn below TFI. The next piece I want to talk a little bit about is growth stage structure. So this is thinking about when you've got your time since fire and you've got your change in successional patterns, what's the, how much of the landscape is within different stages, within different growth stages. So we're thinking about across the entire landscape, what are we seeing? How much is in that juvenile stage, adolescent stage, mature, old? These don't necessarily align directly to the tolerable fire intervals. There's a fair bit of alignment, but there's not. But what this does give us from a fire management perspective is you start to get some spatialization of your patterns. You can start to think about how much their extent there is, and we can start to think about fire mosaics as well in terms of uh, species that use multiple different fire ages. When we start looking at growth stage structure, we see a similar pattern to tolerable fire intervals. You notice this one, this, we can start to forecast out what our expectations into the future are. And this is, when we start looking at later on, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about desirable states and endpoints. You can start to think about, well, how long is it going to take to get some of these things into a, a state that we want to see? But again, if we look over time from 1980, um, Significant increases generally in that juvenile and adolescent stage, bearing in mind we're losing a lot of unknown fire history, but that unknown is probably older, generally, but this is in terms of fire history. Um, so we're not, not entirely sure what we're losing, but with some of those older vegetation types. But what we're seeing is that certainly a big increase in the juvenile and adolescent areas, age classes can start to get a bit more information when we start thinking about these in terms of what ecosystems, when you break this down in the eco, different ecosystems, um, and we can start to say, well, OK, what are we, what are we seeing in a different place? Um, where are the areas where we've got significant uh, juvenile or adolescent? So we're looking at you know, some of the um, alpine treeless vegetation, huge areas of juvenile, probably under undesirable states. Species habitat suitability. So this is one that we really did develop through those bushfire management strategies. We had this process for quite a while um, and, and it builds on a, on a lot of work around, you know, builds on the work that sort of Barry Fox and Marilyn Fox did in the 1980s around habitat accommodation models and how we're looking at succession patterns of, of faunal species particularly. Um, but we can calculate habitat suitability across the landscape. So relative to fire. This is not saying, this is not the same as a species distribution model that says this is where the species is and we're taking every variable. We're looking at the species and saying, well, how, how's the, the habitat seen for a species um, relative to its relationship with fire? So we take a species, are we going to take Red Lord Whistler? We're taking a distribution map to say, how's that, where, where can the species occur? We're taking the vegetation type map to say, what are the different vegetation types within where it occurs? 
We fit species response curves for each species with time since fire in this case. So this is a species response curve with time since fire. So along the x-axis you have how many years since fire. On the y-axis you've got either a probability of occurrence or an abundance estimate of a species. And we're looking at that. Now if you do that for every single vegetation type that the species can occur in, so you, I've showed the same uh, response curve here, but we have a different response curve across each vegetation type. And then you add your fire history, then you can calculate what is essentially a species habitat suitability map relative to fire. So how good is the, the habitat relative to the fire age that that species likes? And then you can add it up across the landscape and say, well, how's that population going? Um, and then, yes, that's right. And then, and then you rinse and repeat thousands of times for every species and every vegetation type, and you start to get a build a, an idea of how species habitat is changing. Um, and to give an idea of that, this is, again, so I'm, I've stolen this from Nev, um, but this is you know, what you can do when you start thinking about something like the yellow belly glider, for instance, and we can look at the central highlands and we can map the species response curve and we can change, follow that through time. We don't actually use this for yellow belly glider because we have better, better information, but I stole an old slide off Nev here. Um, but you can then say, where does, it, where does it occur in the landscape and how is that changing through time as well? So this is interesting talking about those... Um, you know, fuzzy patterns, because the, the, the best bit of habitat's not the same spot through time um, and where it is in the landscape. But we can forecast, so if you look at the, the years there, you can then start to put in fire scenarios. Um, and I see some of the flare groups sitting up here who do this. Um, you know, you can start putting future fire scenarios in and saying, well, okay, what's the, the habitat for these species in the future? And then we can start saying, well, what's the strategy that gives us the fire scenario that we want? And we can start pop looking at that population change through time. So this is when we start doing this. We do this for lots of different species, and I've just shown an example here. And it's interesting to think about averages when you start looking at this, because we can look at populations through time. Um, this is actually not the correct data. This is a figure on data that we did a little while back. But um, if you're looking through time and you're saying, OK, well, how are species going? Um, if you look at the average, there's winners and losers, and they cancel each other out. So you're getting some species that are going up and doing really well and other species that are going down. Now, if you're using a geometric mean, and there's lots of other things that you can look at to, to look at um, indicators here, but generally we can now start to look at these, these individual species patterns through time and think about how they're going. Um, I'm going to move on to the Ecosystem Resilience Monitoring Program now. So this is a program that we set up. Um, it was a, a piece of work that we did after the uh, framework for monitoring, evaluation and reporting. Um, I was actually at La Trobe University when this was being developed. Steve Leonard and Angie Haslam led it with Mike and, and others um, on this, how do you measure and look at the ecosystem resilience type metrics you're looking at and how do you test them and, and put the underpinning data in. Standardised surveys at two and a half, bit over 2,000 sites across the state, cameras, bird surveys, call recorders of floristics and vegetation structure. Um, this is looking at 11 broad vegetation groups, which are about 70% of the state. And the aim here is to be able to build those, evaluate and expand our understanding of those species response curve data. The, the, the uh, sites are stratified by time since fire and fire intervals, um, so previous fire interval. Uh, so we can start to look at TFI thresholds, we can update growth stage threshold, thresholds, we can start to improve those metrics and methods. So we're trying to instill that adaptive management. Here's our approach, here's our measures, how do they hold up? Um, and then I'll get to the next piece now. So the next few years, this is where we're heading. Defining desirable states, updating our modelling and, and standardised monitoring. This is critical pieces of work that are, that are ongoing. Coming out of uh, the inquiries post-2019 and, and 20 fires, there was a, a recommendation to look at what are outcomes targets for ecosystem resilience. So bushfire management, ecosystem resilience is a, an objective of the code of practice, and we want to look at that. And we want to say, well, how do we define a desirable state? So there's a bunch of work that we're doing to look at this. But the first step that we did, we said, well, the measures we've got, are they any good? So we, we got... Um, University of Melbourne, Kate Gillowan and, uh, and Luke Kelly, and I've just got Kate's surname wrong, but um, pronounced wrong, but um, they, they reviewed the resilience metrics and 
these are not the only findings, but the, some of the main findings were that, you know, things like geometric mean of abundance, which we tended to use, but managers find really difficult to think about how you actually implement a change in geometric mean of abundance that's, that's valuable. Um, tolerable fire intervals, growth stage structure, they're all pretty good metrics. They're all pretty good ways of measuring how the ecosystem's going. They don't cover everything. Um, the critical piece is the underpinning data. And so that's where things like the Ecosystem Resilience Monitoring Program come in, is building that underpinning data. Um, we've had another review here thinking about how do you use these metrics for outcomes targets. La Trobe University, Mike's in the, in the audience today, Angie Haslam, Jim Radford, Andrew Bennett all on this project. Current metrics are useful. There's a need to expand the number of metrics. Those three metrics by, that we had initially are, are probably not enough. Individual species are important. Again, underpinning data is a, is a key piece. So updated modelling. This is, this is our pieces. This is, this is the piece I'm most comfortable with because this is where I come from. But I'm, I'm going to, and then I see Tom Fairman laughing up there because we were talking earlier, can I get a Malliemurin into this? Um, this is not a forest species unless you think of Mali as quite small forests, but it still gives an indication of the type of work that we need to do. On the left is a piece that Jemima Connell, a PhD student at La Trobe University did, um, where we're using presence-only modelling to look at these response curves and look at populations across the, the, the landscape, the, the species distribution modelling that we had. Um, we were working with the, the department and, and Parks Vic at the time to say, you know, where are the important areas? Where should we set up our strategies for bushfire management? Where do we need to be looking at, at fire prevention and, and protection? Um, and we built that map. Simon Verdon um, and I were working on this and we knew there were areas where the species didn't drop out in these old age classes. Had a Colcoin National Park, great spots for Malliemurans. They're 100 years old, they've never had fire in them as far as we're aware, um, some of these spots, and, and there's emu ends everywhere. The, the, the spinifex didn't drop out, other parts in Western Sunset. So what Simon did is he went and looked at different parts of the landscape and said, well, what's happening with the species response curves in different parts of the landscape? The pat from, from zero, directly after fire, this species lives in spinifex, it lives in spinifex grass that burns in fire. From directly after a fire up to the sort of 20 or 30 years after fire, you get a similar, similar positive trajectory, the population grows, the occurrence, likelihood of occurrence increases. When you look at different parts in the landscape relative to this, the depth of sand, um, so whether this is up on a high sand dune or whether it's down on a sandy area, the triadia only really grows in the sandy areas, you get different response curves. So you start building this understanding of different parts of the landscape are having a different pattern. And it's really interesting to think about this when people say time since fire is not important. Time since fire can be easily over overlooked if you're not looking at the other variables that are driving that pattern. So starting to build these models beyond that. I thought I'd throw this in because Fred Rainsford just had this published I think two weeks ago. Um, again, looking at other regime variables is really important. What we're looking at on the left here, don't need to look at a lot of the details. This is looking at across two different ecosystems, across Mallee and across Foothills Forest. Um, on the, on the x-axis it's just showing the variables that you're using to try and estimate where that population of the species is. And if you just use time since fire, when you add spatial context, if you add the context of the fire around the site, how much the extent of fire, the diversity of patterns around the site, you get a much better model of where the species occurs. When you start looking at this in terms of things like time since fire, you start seeing these patterns that you're getting, but then you're looking at how much late successional vegetation or early successional vegetation or spatial diversity is around a species. Um, the site that you looked at, and you get a response for that. So these are the types of updated modelling. Now, we're only at the, the, the time since fire modelling generally, the simple modelling at the moment, to do at the scale that we want across the state. But this is, now that we've developed FAME, we've developed model-based approaches. This is the types of approaches we can keep, keep moving to, on to. This is another piece of work we're doing. Cindy Hauser is leading this at Arthur Island Institute, a piece of work we're doing. So. Traditionally, when we started using FAME, the, we used the data that was available, which was an expert elicited data set. Um, and we've done a, a significant amount of um, work to, to build that data set. But one of the things is there are a lot of species, a lot of vegetation types in the state, and even with huge data collection, to still understand what do we expect the fire response to be, we start running out of, of time and space. 
Expert elicited data is one way to get the data, presence only data. We've, in fact, some of the data I showed earlier, we used Victorian Biodiversity Atlas to build these response curves or species distribution modeling approaches. You can use empirical survey data where you've got it. What Cindy's doing and, and some other work that we're doing with Arthur Ryla is we're looking at two things. One is, how do you choose the value of information? Because we often say empirical data is better, but emp empirical data could be one site from one place and you know, one person, whereas we might have expert data that's across 20 experts that really know their species. So you actually, it's not as easy as saying one type of data is better than another. So building a, a, an analysis of how you define what the type of data is you use, and then building modeling techniques like these Bayesian, Bayesian hierarchical models that, that Cindy's working on and Jenny and our team's worked on, um, allows you to start to mash these different things together. And this becomes really important as you move forward into other species from birds as well. Birds are really great because most of us survey in a really similar way, except call recorders obviously are changing that. Um, but when you're looking at mammals, you've got pitfall traps and cage traps and cameras and every else, and you're trying to mash together four or five different techniques to figure out how a species responds over time and then understand what that um, approach is and what the abundance estimates are. The other piece, the other key piece that we need to be thinking about is how does fire interact with all of these other processes? So we've got, you know, pest, plant and animals. Um, this is a statement that I, I really liked, but basically where we're, the, the, the point is, if we're not in considering all these other interactions, we're probably not gonna get an outcome that we're after. It doesn't take away from anything in terms of fire management. You've still gotta do the right fire management to get the right outcome, and you've still gotta have the good data behind that, but we need to start thinking about integrating that. But the scale of these things becomes quite big. Standardized monitoring programs become really important in this stage. And Ella, this is your shout out to Ella Plumen. Plume and Paton, if we're getting that right. So this is her work. So the stat, that ecosystem resilience monitoring project that we set up. Um, so these have all been delivered as research partnerships. Um, this is Ella's paper that came out of that, have I got it there? Yep, from Fire Ecology earlier this year. Um, and what we're looking at here is this is the, the time since fire for different species um, and looking at the proportion of immature plants or mature plants. And this is really interesting, this piece of work. I really like this, Ella, because it starts to make you think about things like our tolerable fire intervals in a fuzzy way, because it starts to say, I can, I can start looking at this and saying, well, actually, what, what, what percentage of, what, what percentage of silver bags here do I really want in a site? If I, if I burn a little earlier, I'm actually gonna knock out more of these. If I burn a little, if I leave it a little longer, we're gonna get more of them, because they're, they're already mature. But the maturity rates are, are variable across these. So how many mature individuals do you have? Um, this was Leanne Greenwood, I put this in because I didn't even know anything about this and I thought this is the value of these monitoring programs that are done in research partnerships. This was a piece of work that was done on fungi. It used the same sites of our surveys but didn't, wasn't actually part of our surveys. We weren't looking at fungi, we weren't looking at fire, but by setting up a major monitoring program, we're getting these extra benefits which are you know, the extra pieces to start looking at. The other critical piece about getting some standardised monitoring programs going back to these sites is starting to look at those. Where are the demonstrated success stories? Where are we actually getting the outcomes we want? Um, and where aren't we? And this is where I talk about we can build great models and we can we could do great fire management and get great outcomes and say you develop the right perfect habitat for long-footed potteroos. But if they're all being eaten by foxes, we're not investing well from a, an ecosystem outcomes point of view. And then I wanted to finish on something, um, I don't know, maybe it's, it, it, it's, it's somewhat hopeful. So um, I don't like to use the word hope. A colleague of mine says hope is not a strategy. Um, so, you know, this is, but, but, I, but I, I do think that this is, uh, talking about the complexity of fire management and where you can be successful. And this is where I was going to have another shout out to the Flare Group. We've got another piece of work we're doing really looking at what are the multiple different levers that you can pull in a fire management context to get an ecological outcome. So starting to really look at those ecosystems. We've got some good data on those metrics, pulling all these things together. And this is an example from the 2019-20 fires. People might have known it was the Radar Hill burn. Um, there's so much black and white discussion around things like fuel management does work, fuel management doesn't work. Phil's talking about you know, 
where you get caught into traps potentially or you're, you're driving um, a situation where um, you know, you, you're in a more flammable system. This is an example of showing in these large landscape weather-driven events generally, so um, where we saw fire management effective. And it wasn't one thing at all. There's no silver bullet. This was an area where we saw the fire pull up, but we know it came through and it hit the area as, as the fire was moderating because it was getting later at night, so it wasn't coming through as hard. So um, we had, there was a strategic fuel break in this area, not one of the proposed strategic fuel breaks, but this was a, there's a fuel break along this road. We had suppression resources that worked in there. All of these things were needed to get a positive outcome in this case. Um, so it's really important for us to be thinking about fire management. Um, but this one, this is one of those examples where you go, it's, it's a cherry picked case study where everything sort of went right, I'm no denying that. Um, but it does mean that even in really significant fire events, there's influence and I think you know, Owen Price's work has shown there's some cases where things work, getting it in the right place, in the right part of the landscape where you've got the best evidence that it's gonna be and have an impact, we can get some, some decent outcomes. So I think I've packed a fair bit into that. Um, and everyone's now across everywhere we are. Um, I can open up and I'm not sure how.